Hello, thank you for joining today's webinar, Discovering Resources, a roundtable with discussion with FAST and Disability Rights Florida. Before we begin, this webinar has American Sign Language interpretation, as well as Spanish language interpretation. Before we begin, I'm going to turn it over to our interpreters to give a brief overview on how to access the Spanish channel. Thank you. So I'm going to be giving these instructions in Spanish and then in English. Eh, buenos días a todos, a todas. Eh, les, rec les recomendamos que en caso que ustedes quieran escuchar esta reunión en español, por favor, activen la interpretación en Zoom, haciendo clic en el globo donde dice interpretación, abajo a la derecha de su pantalla, y elijan el idioma en el que desean participar. Si están conectados a Zoom por medio de su teléfono, por favor, toquen los tres puntos en la esquina inferior derecha, donde dice más, después toquen interpretación de idiomas, elijan su idioma de preferencia y luego toquen finalizado. Es muy importante que eh, toquen finalizado. Eh, si tienen alguna pregunta o una dificultad con la interpretación, por favor, déjenos saber, estaremos disponibles por medio del chat. Um, hello, good morning, everyone. We're going to be providing interpretation today in English and Spanish. So if you need uh, interpretation, please make sure that you click on the interpretation glove in the lower right side of your screen and choose the language in which you like to listen. If you're connecting to Zoom through your phone, please touch the three dots at the bottom right corner where it says more, then tap language interpretation, choose the language again that you would like to listen and then touch done on the top right corner. If you have any issues with the interpretation, please let us know and I will be happy to assist you. Thank you. Thank you so much for those instructions. Before we begin, I want to go over some additional housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the ABLE United YouTube channel at a later date. Also, if you're attending this seeking credits for waiver support coordination or support living coach through the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, that certificate will be mailed to you uh, probably tomorrow, if not early next week. Uh, as we begin, there are a lot of resources available for the disability community, and navigating them can be very difficult and even overwhelming. Uh, and there's some even resources that you might not even be aware of. And so we're honored today to have two advocates who are passionate about helping individuals and families gain independence. To share more information about these two resources, I'm joined today by first Eric Reed. Interim Executive Director and New Horizon Loan Program Director of Florida Alliance for Assistive Services and Technology, better known as FAST, because saying that every time would be a mouthful. Eric is responsible for implementing policies and procedures that expand opportunities for assessing, assessing assistive technology devices, as well as managing the day-to-day -day operations of the loan program. Eric has worked in the financial field for over 20 years and defines that experience along with customer focus management uh, to the FAST financial loan program. Also, I have Kevin Golombeski, Director of Advocacy, Education, and Outreach at Disability Rights Florida. There, he supervises advocates and attorneys who assist individuals with disabilities with a variety of issues from special education to employment to equal access issues. Before joining DRF, uh, he litigated disability rights cases at a private civil rights law firm and served as the Deputy Solicitor General for the state of Florida. He's also a Harvard Law graduate, so honored to have you today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, as I mentioned, this is being recorded. I've talked about how you can get your certificate after. We're going to have time towards the end of this presentation to talk about uh, open the floor for Q&A. And you can see there's a Q&A questions and answer tab. There you can enter your input. And before I turn this over and let them go through their slides, I want to just echo uh, to see how familiar you are with FAST and, and Disability Rights Florida. So there's a short poll we're going to put up to kind of get an idea of your knowledge. And hopefully that this program, today's webinar, will give you better uh, education, the tools you need to serve the, the population that we all work together to serve. So we'll go ahead and put that poll up. How familiar are you with Florida Alliance for Assistive Services and Technology? And the same for how familiar are you with Disability Rights Florida? Uh, and so having these experts today, we're gonna learn a ton and then also have some time to answer those questions. So I'll give everybody a few moments. 
answer them. All right. Thank you all for participating in that. And are we able to share the poll results? All right, this is great. So for, for FAST, all right, Eric has some work cut out for him, about 64% not familiar. And Disability Rights Florida, uh, a little bit over place, a little more familiar. Uh, and so being able to better understand that as one of these uh, kind of hidden gem resources uh, and talking about just discovering resources and how ABLE plays a role in all of this is, Together, we all serve the, a very broad disability community. And with ABLE accounts being able to save uh, after tax dollars for them to grow tax free and be used for a variety of qualified disability expense really goes hand in hand with some of these surface, services, uh, allowing individuals to have a, achieve a better life experience, the, the acronym for ABLE. And so hopefully you could see how a uh, savings and investment account can be utilized alongside these other services and really uh, help individuals um, meet and exceed the things they need and want in life. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Eric to talk to Morris about FAST. Eric? Great, thank you, John. And thanks for ABLE United for allowing FAST to come on and, and share some, some resources and share some information uh, with everybody that's joined us today. So I'm Eric Reed, I'm the Interim Executive Director at FAST. I'm also the Financial Loan Program Director. It's also known as the New Horizon Loan Program. So we'll just jump right in and, um, and get on with the presentation. Next slide, please. There we go. So what is FAST? So as John said, we have a very long name. Uh, so we'll just stick with FAST uh, through the rest of the presentation. But we are the state's assistive technology program. And we'll also shorten assistive technology down to AT for the majority of this presentation as well. So every state um, in the country has an assistive technology program that has been created through federal uh, legislation. Uh, the Federal uh, Assistive Technology Act of 2004, um, which was just re-upped um, at the end of 2022. So uh, we are thankful for that. And then we also have a Florida statute that uh, created FAST as the state's assistive technology program funded through Department of Education and specifically vocational rehab. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for Floridians with disabilities by increasing access to assistive technology through empowerment and collaboration. And that collaboration part is a, is a big part of our strategic plan moving forward. Um, great to be on here with, with ABLE United as a, as a partner and collaborating with them through the poll. Um, as John mentioned, we have a lot of work uh, to continue that collaboration. So those numbers climb and, and more people with disabilities throughout the state are familiar with, with FAST and with the services that we offer. Next slide, please. We serve all Floridians with disabilities. We serve all of their family members, guardians, authorized representatives. We serve representatives of education, employment, health, community living, technology, anybody that might ever have a need for knowing about or using or giving out or providing assistive technology or assistive technology services. We are there for them, and we try to expand our services um, as broad as we can to serve all of those different uh, communities. So a lot of people, first time they hear of us, may ask, what is assistive technology or what is AT? So the, the definition that we use, that's the, the federal definition, I guess you would say, is a device is any item, piece of equipment, of product or system whether acquired commercially off the shelf, modified or customized, that is used to increase or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. So really AT can be anything that provides independence or provides improved function for somebody with a disability. And that's across all realms of disabilities, vision, computer access, aids for daily living, hearing, uh, mobility, recreation, 
Uh, we, we try to expand and get into all of those. We have a, a great recreational um, adaptive program. We have a lot of hand cycles and other recreation equipment that people can borrow. We do a lot of work with um, audiologists across the state through the financial loan program um, is becoming uh, more and more important for people to, to purchase hearing aids as that's one of those categories that you typically don't find any type of other resources through insurance or benefits or anything like that. The goal of AT, we like to say, is to increase function and also to increase um, independence. I use increasing independence a lot because it, it certainly is, in our mind, uh, one of the most important things and reasons why uh, somebody should seek out the AT that is going to give them uh, the best life that they possibly can have. And the, the choices are endless, um, and the, the ability of people with AT is, is endless. A couple other points on AT and why it is important for folks is it certainly promotes self-esteem. Um, it certainly improves quality of life, can increase productivity in the workplace, at home, um, enhances performance, and increases independence. So all important things and all ways that we can use our services to, to better people um, and to provide that, that opportunity. Uh, we'll also you know, talk as this, this meeting goes on today, how this can also be combined with, with ABLE United and how an ABLE account um, can be used with some of these services and the importance of our services um, when you're making your buying decisions with all the money that you've been able to to save through your ABLE United accounts. We'll switch a little bit out of just specifically what AT is and get into what our core services are and where we can provide assistance to you. So we really have six core services uh, that we're tasked with as the state's AT program. Uh, those are public awareness and training, information and assistance, device demonstrations, short-term loans, which are free loans for people to borrow things, device reuse and reutilization, and then our financial loan program. Public awareness is, is pretty straightforward and simple. You hopefully have seen us at some events that you attend. We try to, to be around the state as much as possible. I'd say we attend upwards of 15 to 20 different events um, through either our headquarters or through our um, resource centers that we have around the state. So please look for us um, at an event that you are attending. If you don't see us at an event, please contact us and, and let us know if you think it would be a good place uh, for FAST to be able to um, get out in front of more people. Please let us know that as well. Our training program uh, can in, involve a lot of different things. So we can provide general awareness training that just shows benefits of a broad range of assistive technology, um, funding sources that might be available um, to purchase the assistive technology. Uh, we also can do skills development training. Uh, we do have 12 centers around the state. And at those centers, um, there's some um, assistive technology professionals, there's um, AT mentors to them, and there's a lot of folks that just have a general broad strong understanding of the devices in their in their device libraries and can provide specific skill development training to people. And then we also can provide training to organizations um, to help them learn more about AT, to learn more about how um, specific um, adaptations at their um, centers, at their place of work may provide a better resource for employees or future employees. Our information and assistance, our INA, uh, we've got a, a great person working for us, Tim McCann, um, who's been uh, working with the disability community his entire life and is our main resource for INA. So if you ever have a question about what we do, if you ever are looking for um, other resources outside of what FAST does, 
within the disability community, um, just give us a call. Um, our contact information is at the end of this presentation, of course, so um, we'll be more than happy to help you out with that. Device demonstrations is probably one of the biggest things that, that we do. It's a little bit um, different than, than the training. Uh, device demonstrations get much more detailed into specific devices, um, comparing a couple devices together, uh, really to help you make more informed buying choices um, and for a couple other reasons. The next slide will show those. So, uh, um, Actually, I was incorrect about that, but we can stay on this slide. Um, the device demonstrations can can really be used to to help you realize what device is going to provide you the the best functionality, the best independence, um, and you can use one or two devices at the same time to compare and contrast uh, what they may do for you. Once you've done that. Uh, we have a device loan program, a short-term device loan program, where you can borrow anything that we have in our catalogs, um, in our libraries, um, that's from our headquarters and through all of our 12 centers, um, and you can take those home for 30 days at no cost to you. Um, if it's something that we have in our headquarters um, that's not available local to you, we'll ship it to you at no charge and we'll ship it back to us at no charge. So it's a completely free resource for you um, to be able to borrow devices for, again, decision making. If it's something you think that will benefit you, but you just want to be sure before you do spend um, your money or you do ask for insurance to pay for something, um, you can borrow it and find out more about it and see how it truly will fit your needs. You can use it as a loaner if uh, your device is being repaired. Um, hopefully we have something in stock that will be able to uh, benefit you while yours is being repaired. Um, or accommodations, a short-term basis. Uh, we, especially with some mobility devices, people come in from out of town, uh, don't want to travel with something, we may be able to fill in um, and let them borrow something for a short, short term. And then we also have a lot of professionals that will borrow equipment um, and take that with them so they're able to, to use it for their clients, their patients, whatever the case may be. So some of the devices in our library, just a couple pictures, but a lot of communication devices, probably our most popular thing that people borrow are just iPads. Um, but have different apps on them, ProLoco, other communication um, apps that might be important to somebody uh, would be on the iPads. Um, switches are a big thing. Um, vision, you see a, a brilliant um, device up in the top left corner. Um, so that's certainly something that we have. Um, home automation through Amazon Alexa, uh, we have some of those devices that people can borrow, um, hook up through their home and see what see what might work, what might not work. Um, and then a lot of just aids for daily living. You see like a pencil grip. Uh, we do a lot of just small, small things that people often don't even look for um, or consider as assistive technology or AT um, can be a huge benefit for people. So we've got a huge inventory of devices uh, for people to come in and look at and see what might be a, a benefit to them. We also have a reuse program that uh, we partner with uh, multiple centers for independent living around the state. Uh, we help them with some of their funding to uh, clean up, to repair, refurbish donated equipment that they receive so we can get that back out into the community. Um, that is all at no charge. So anything that the CILs get in on donation and use our funds to to refurbish that goes right back out to the community for free. Um, we also have reuse programs through our website where people can actually post an item for sale or for donation either way. Uh, we don't get involved in the transaction. We don't take ownership or sell it, but individuals can do that on their own and they can post whatever they would like that is um, AT related and try to get that back out to somebody that might need it. And then finally, our financial loan program. Uh, so this one is near and dear to my heart as I've been the, the loan program director for the past eight years now. And our financial loan program is a, really we, we are our own mini bank. Uh, we have our own funding that we've received through various grants 
over the years uh, that we use as our loan capital. And we loan that out to individuals with disabilities to help them purchase the assistive technology that they need. It's not a last resort program, um, although it's often used that way for uh, the final piece of the puzzle. If maybe insurance or benefits are gonna pay for part of a device, uh, but not all of it. Um, since we're on Enable United uh, webinar, you may have money that will get you pretty close, but not all the way saved up. And it's something that you need now. Um, you know the independence is gonna be there if you could have this. We may be able to step in and provide a financial loan for that last part of it. Um, so that's a, it's a great tool for people to use. We wish we had money just to give to give as grants for everybody to get the AT they need. Unfortunately, um, that, is, that is not the case, uh, but we do lend out um, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year um, in new loans for folks. So um, if there's ever anything you need with that, please reach out to us um, and we will see if it's something that, um, that you would qualify for. How do you access our services? Uh, again, all of our services are free uh, with the exception of the, you know, I, the, the interest rate, I guess, on the financial loan program, uh, which since I mentioned that is only 5.5%, so a very low interest rate. Uh, but we, we service everything through our demonstration centers around the state, uh, through the CILs that partner with us for reuse, and then through our state headquarters that is located here in Tallahassee. There is our contact information, 1-844-FL-FAST. Uh, gets you to, to our direct line, gets you to Tim in our office. My email there is ereed at fast.org. Um, and fast.org is our website. And so feel free to, to go there, find a, a service center that's closest to you. Again, we do have 12 demonstration centers around the state. Uh, we are able to increase that. Uh, just last year, uh, we used to have six. We've added six more centers um, to really try to serve more of the rural communities in the state that uh, were not, although we did serve all 67 counties, it was hard to, to really get to everybody uh, with just six centers. We've increased that to 12, uh, knowing there's still certainly room for growth and that's um, future plans. But as for now, we've got a, a great network out there and some great folks ready to help you out and um, take care of all of your um, assistive technology needs. And with that, I'll pass it back over to, to John. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. I think that was very informational. I learned some things. Uh, I love how you try to weave Able United in there and how we can always partner together. Uh, so exciting things. Um, just wanted to remind everybody, if you do have questions, go ahead and fill out the information in the QA box. Uh, before we bring on Kevin, there was one I thought was pretty interesting about um, being able to provide equipment as a service provider through APD. Um, so, so I know we, we both have a relationship with the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, but when it comes to equipment, uh, do you partner with them in that or is that just separate altogether? Yeah, that's separate altogether. Um, we certainly partner with them with as we would with any other group to provide any information or training that their folks might need. Um, we certainly partner with them with trying to work with our clients to see what they may qualify for or inform them of those services um, is one of our, our big, big things through information assistance is trying to make sure everybody knows what's out there and encourage them to, to seek out other sources. Awesome, wonderful. All right, well, let's go ahead and bring on Kevin back on uh, and kind of really turn it over him to talk about Disability Rights Florida. It's, a, it's an organization I love. I know it, um, a little bit about my background. I was with the ARCA Florida for, for about 10 years before coming to launch the ABLE program and knowing uh, that we, we, we partnered a lot with Disability Rights Florida, um, doing great legislative and uh, government work across the state. So. Uh, Interested in learning more, Kevin, so I'm going to turn this over to you to talk about Disability Rights Florida. Thanks. Well, and thanks, everybody, for listening in today and taking your time. Um, I'm excited to be here. I know we have a big audience. My name is Kevin Golombieski, and I'm the Director of Advocacy, Education, and Outreach at Disability Rights Florida. 
Um, I'm a white male in my mid thirties with brown hair and wearing a checkered polo shirt. And I'm sitting in an office in front of my bookshelf, which is largely empty. Uh, I need to get some more books on there. Um, but I'll go ahead and jump right in to our overview. So this is what I want to accomplish today. I'm hoping that I can explain what Disability Rights Florida is, what types of services we offer, the specific issues we can assist you with in a real concrete way. And I hope to give examples and then to provide an overview of how you can access our services at DRF. And so Disability Rights Florida is a Florida's federally mandated protection and advocacy agency. And so what does that even mean? Um, I think it can be confusing because the words agency suggests we might be a state agency or a federal agency, but we're not at all. We're an independent entity that serves in the, the disabled community within Florida and advocates for their rights. So we receive federal funding and we're part of a larger system of our protection advocacy agencies, but we are independent from the state, independent from the federal government. <clears throat> and if you're having issues with state or federal agencies, we can advocate against them because we are independent. We just serve a unique role in that we're charged by federal leg legislation and a Florida governor's executive order with enforcing the rights of persons with disabilities throughout the state and we receive federal funding to accomplish that goal. And so our mission as the state's protection advocacy agency is to advance the quality of life, dignity, equality, self-determination, and freedom of choice of persons with disabilities through collaboration, education, advocacy, as well as legal and legislative strategies. And that's a really broad mission and I think it's indicative of the model and the role of protection advocacy agencies. So we take a very holistic approach to protecting the rights of persons with disabilities. We engage in direct advocacy with um, state agencies, with businesses, with any kind of entity that might be interfering with your rights as a person with disabilities. We also, when necessary, will litigate to protect the rights of persons with disabilities and we pair that more adversarial work with outreach, education, and legislative strategies with the goal of raising awareness among the broader community of the issues that persons with disabilities face and kind of winning over hearts and minds because advocacy and litigation can only get you so far. At the end of the day, you have to raise awareness in the community and change the culture to be more inclusive and respect the rights of persons with disabilities. And we're really charged and focused on doing both of those things. And so here's some background on protection and advocacy agencies and the history of it. So it really started, the, the agency system started back in the 70s when Geraldo Rivera did an expose on the Willowbrook Institution in New York. And he got footage and really showed that individuals with disabilities were being warehoused in Willowbrook Institution and being abused and neglected and their rights weren't being enforced. And this really raised awareness among the public of the need for a protection system and also among federal legislators. Um, this really wasn't just an isolated incident. There were Willowbrooks all across the country, examples all across the country of folks with disabilities not having their rights protected. And so Senator Jacob Javits of New York introduced legislation to create the PNA protection advocacy system. Um, now, I think it's really important here to recognize that, and I, and I imagine a lot of you all live this and, and recognize this, that you can have laws on the books, you can have laws protecting the rights of persons with disabilities, but they're really meaningless unless someone is enforcing them. And that's what the PNA system was created to do. And that's what Willowbrook, recognized and showed to the public. And that's what Senator Jacob Javits recognized when he introduced the legislation to create the PNA system. And so DRF's history as the state's PNA started back in 1977. So a few years after the Willowbrook investigation, uh, Governor 
Ruben asked you establish the governor's commission on advocacy. Um, and that was the, the first iteration of Disability Rights Florida. Later, we became known as the Advocacy Center for Persons with Disabilities, and we were established as an independent nonprofit with our own board. And then in 2010, we were renamed Disability Rights Florida, and that's a common name you'll see across the country. So the PNA in Texas is Disability Rights Texas, for example, and it's the same in other states. Okay, so now, now I'll move past that overview of the PNA system and disability rights history and kind of get into the, the nuts and bolts of how we can assist you and what services we offer. So there's really three reasons. I'm gonna start broad and then try to kind of narrow in here. And so on this slide, it lists the three reasons to contact us. One, we're free and confidential. Two, we offer a really variety of services, and I think our, our broad mission and our commitment to both advocacy, litigation, and outreach kind of highlights that or previews it. And then we have a wide range of priority areas that we're able to devote our resources to and assist with. So first, the free and confidential. Um, our services have no charge. If you contact us, there's no income requirement. If, if some of you have worked with legal aid organizations, those are only providing services to individuals with certain income levels. That does not apply with us. Um, if you're a person with a disability, we're able to assist you. Our services are also confidential. So Disability Rights Florida is a public interest law firm. That's one way to think of us. And so when we accept a case of yours, the rules of the Florida bar are going to apply, which include attorney client privilege. So our work is supervised by attorneys and it's confidential. And finally, in addition to having no charge, being confidential, there's really broad eligibility, like I indicated. Unlike other service providers, if you're a person with a disability, any disability, our grants will allow us to assist you if your issue falls within our goals and priorities. And so here's our services that we offer on this slide at a very high level. A lot of our callers will receive short-term services, and those might include things like information and referral, self-advocacy support, technical assistance, um, and information and referral might be, for example, a list of resources in your community that could help you with your problem, if it's not a problem that we can specifically assist with. Self-advocacy support and technical assistance usually is one of our advocates or attorneys talking to you about your rights, listening to the problem you're having, and providing you tools and advice on how to navigate that problem. Now, if that type of assistance isn't sufficient and there's a, a legal violation that you're facing, then we would escalate our support and you would receive other types of services like investigations, advocacy services, and legal representation. And so an investigation might involve one of our advocates contacting the entity you're having issues with, requesting records, talking to you, and trying to get a sense of what's going on and whether we can be effective in helping you. And if we can, then we might provide direct advocacy to that entity, or if necessary, representation in a lawsuit against them. Now, whether we can assist you with a particular issue and provide advocacy services or legal representation is really dictated by our goals and priorities. So as a PNA, we receive federal funding from different grants and the grants dictate the types of issues we can assist with. The, the biggest thing to remember is we help with rights violations. We're an enforcement entity to assist you with making sure your rights under federal laws like the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Section 504 are respected. And so you'll see as I talk through our goals and priorities, that's a consistent theme is rights violations and us addressing those. We're not like other organizations that might provide casework or benefits or services. Ours is making sure your rights are respected. And so our goals and priorities are not only 
impacted by that focus on rights, but also public input and the input of our board of directors. Every year, we issue a public survey and folks across the state will indicate to us what's important to them because the issues that persons with disabilities face is diverse and they're constantly changing. Um, transportation, housing, access to employment, different parts of the state have different issues. And so we try to take all that survey data and develop goals and priorities so that we can devote our resources to hitting the issues that are important to you and that are interfering with your ability to be independent and have self-determination. And so this year in 2023, our goals and priorities, we have, we have seven main goals and then a variety of priorities under them. And so the, our goals are on the, the screen now. Um, the first goal is challenging barriers to equal, equal opportunity and community inclusion. The second is support the right to self-determination and transition to in independence for individuals with disabilities. Based on our public input, bridging the gap between K through 12 education and the transition into work and adult life is a major area of importance for people across the state. And so that's why that's a goal. The third goal is increasing access to home and community-based supports and services. That's consistently been on our priorities and goals over the past several years. The fourth goal is increasing accessibility to public programs, services, and transportation. That's another area that's been a pretty consistent focus for us. Um, in, this, in Florida, I grew up here. I had a parent with disabilities that limited our family's ability to get transportation. And I know firsthand that that is an, always an issue in Florida. Um, accessibility to public transportation, Medicaid transportation, and other issues. And our public survey data really confirms that. Our fifth goal, reduce the incidence of abuse, neglect, and rights violations. That's consistently an issue, and that's kind of the genesis of the PNA system, making sure people aren't abused or neglected in facilities. And then our last two goals are really focused on outreach, education, and legislative work. I'm going to focus the over the next several minutes on our first five goals, which are really our service-oriented goals, and talk less about our legislative and outreach work. Okay, so our first goal, challenging barriers to equal opportunity and community inclusion. That's a pretty broad goal. And there's a lot of services we, were, we provide and issues we address within that goal. So we assist with accessing services from the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation and the Division of Blind Services. We assist with issues related to employment discrimination, work-related barriers to employment, equal access to public accommodations, which is just a fancy word for places you go, like grocery stores, restaurants, movie theaters. We assist with housing discrimination and access to appropriate special education services and supports. And so I'll provide some examples just to give more context to these areas. Say you're a client of the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation and you disagree about what your employment outcome should be, we can help by advocating on your behalf to your vocational rehabilitation counselor. Another example, if your employer has denied you reasonable workplace accommodations, you know, and, or hasn't engaged in an interactive process to accommodate you at your job, we can help by either providing you information and advice, or we can advocate directly to your employer to make sure that they are really considering the accommodations you've requested and complying with the law. Another specific example, if you've been denied entry to a medical provider because you have a service animal, we can help by contacting the provider and explaining that the, Medi the Americans with Disabilities Act protects individuals with service animals. So those are some of the really concrete ways in that first goal with advancing community inclusion and challenging barriers to equal opportunity are things that we can help with or issues if you call us. So our second goal is on the screen now, and it's support the right to self-determination and transition to independence. Um, and on the screen is also a picture of our transition toolkit. 
which is a book that we've put together that includes resources for folks in the transition process from K through 12 education to work and post-secondary education. And it's a really robust guide for accessing services in Florida and it educates folks on their rights. And so I just wanna make sure I mentioned that because you can contact us if you'd like a copy of this toolkit. And it really, I think the fact that we've developed this is a response to the community saying transition is an important issue. And so some of the transition related services that we provide are assisting 18 to 22 year olds who are still in public education with getting appropriate transition services and their individualized education programs because transition is a part of special education and students in that age have a right to get transition services that will give them and prepare them for self-advocacy, independent living, job skills, and also even connecting them with the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. We'll also assist with post-secondary education accommodations. So if you're a college student and you need a scribe in class or extra time on your tests and your college has denied you that accommodation, you can contact us and we can reach out to the college, engage with them, explain their obligations under the Americans with Disabilities Act to provide appropriate accommodations and see if we can help you navigate that issue. We also help identify and raise awareness of alternatives to guardianship, such as supported decision making. Um, and so we have a team here that if you're interested in supported decision making or other less restrictive alternatives to guardianship, they can walk you through that process or even just educate you so that you're aware of it. Um, because I think in our code, in our laws in Florida, there's an emphasis on guardianship, even though there's a number of alternatives that exist and that other states have adopted. And so, this slide is addressing our goal of increased access to home and community-based supports and waivers. And it has a picture on the right of a stethoscope. Um, so we do a, a few things within this goal. We help with access to home and community-based waivers, including the iBudget waiver and the long-term care waiver. So if you've applied to be on the waiver and your application has been denied, we could potentially assist you with appealing that denial at a fair hearing. Um, we could also assist you if you're on the waiver and there's been a reduction of services that's inappropriate. We could also help with an appeal to contest that. I know there's a, a major issue that we're focused on is the significant wait list for some of our waivers. And if you're in a crisis situation, that could be an exception to move you up and get on waiver services despite the wait list. And that's another thing we might be able to assist with. We also help with access to medically necessary health care and appropriate community-based mental health services. And so as far as the health care, we'll help some folks in certain situations with who have been denied full Medicaid, even though they're entitled to Medicaid under a disability-related category, we could help you appeal that decision or do some advocacy directly to the Department of Children and Families, for example, to correct an erroneous eligibility determination. So this slide is increased accessibility to public programs, services, and transportation. And there's a picture on here of a city bus as well as a taxi cab, because I wanted to make sure to emphasize that we help not only with inaccessible public transportation, but inaccessible private transportation. And a growing issue we've seen is, for example, inaccessible or barriers to using Uber and Lyft and other private rideshare companies. So say you call an Uber, the Uber driver shows up and refuses to transport you because you have a wheelchair or you have a service animal. Well, you can contact us and we can contact Uber and try to resolve that so it doesn't happen again, for example. Um, similarly with if there's inaccessible public transportation. 
we can advocate for your rights to make sure that all public transportation is ADA accessible. We also help with ensuring government facilities, websites, and services are accessible. So another issue that might come up or that we've seen is there's a government or state agency application for benefits or services. It's online, but the website is not accessible to someone with a visual impairment, and therefore, they cannot fill out the application. That's something you could call us about, and we could either advocate directly to that state agency to make its website accessible, or we can advocate for an alternative way for you to fill out the application. Other issues we also address under this goal include accessibility of emergency planning services and shelters, and also ensuring accessible voting. Shelters and emergency planning are, of course, a big issue here in Florida. Um, we've devoted a lot of resources to helping folks who were impacted by Ian or who had to go to emergency shelters or special needs shelters post Hurricane Ian. And our role was really making sure that those shelters were accessible and there were accessible avenues to get to those shelters via transportation. And so there's really a wide variety of things that we do under this goal of increased accessibility to public programs, services, and transportation. The next goal, reduce the incidence of abuse, neglect, and rights violations. This is, again, always been a part of the PNA mission, and that's monitoring facilities across the state. And facilities is a broad term. That's monitoring forensic programs, jails, prisons, mental health treatment facilities, detention centers, to make sure that there is no abuse or neglect going on there. We also respond to reports of abuse and neglect and will investigate to make sure that those facilities are providing appropriate services and not violating the rights of the residents of the facilities. We also have a team at Disability Rights Florida that investigates and monitors social security representative payees to make sure that represent payees are complying with their obligations um, that have been developed by the Social Security Administration and ensure that there's no rights violations going on in that context either. Okay, so that's a lot of things that we assist with. It's, it's pretty broad. Wide ranging priorities, remember, is one of the three big reasons to contact Disability Rights Florida in addition to us being free and confidential and providing a lot of services. But there's a lot of things that we also don't assist with. And so this slide lists examples, um, criminal defense, bankruptcy, family law, identity theft, malpractice, mortgage foreclosure, personal injury, probate, property, social security determinations, wills and trusts, real estate, consumer protection, contracts, all these things, the thing that they have in common and to think about before you contact with us about an issue is they're not related specifically to an individual's disability. So if there's some kind of discrimination or rights violation because you're a person with a disability, those are the types of issues we'll address. If you're a person with disability who was in a car accident and wants assistance with that personal injury issue, we wouldn't assist with that. And so for a lot of these issues I just mentioned, if you are to call us, our intake team will likely just provide you an information and referral, usually to the Florida Bar Referral Service. So just remember that discrimination or rights violations because you're a person with disability, that's really our wheelhouse. And so how, how do you access our services? The easiest way is to contact intake, which the number is 1-800-342-0823. We also have an online intake form, and I, the link's on the screen, but just I'll, I'll state it. It's disabilityrightsflorida.org forward slash contact forward slash intake underscore form. And so the, the two main ways to contact us are our 1-800 number, and our online intake form. And when you call intake, they're going to ask you a series of questions. They're going to gather general information 
about your reason for contacting, as well as demographic information and things that we need to collect for purposes of our federal reporting requirements. They're also going to try to do issue spotting to see if the issue that you're bringing to us falls within our goals and priorities. And so how the process works is intake will review the information you provide. They'll, they'll assess, does this fall within all those goals and priorities, the issue presented that I just went through? Um, and if they think it might, they'll forward the case to a team director, someone like me. We have multiple team directors who address different subject matter areas. And so our role as a team director is to consider whether the case meets our case selection criteria. And so I've put on the screen the case selection criteria on this slide. I look at when I'm assessing whether to assign an advocate or attorney the facts of the case, whether the issue falls within our goals and priorities, the likelihood of success, the urgency of a particular matter and likely consequences for the individual, the resources that our agency has available at that time, the available availability of alternative resources, and the impact that resolution of the issue will have upon the broader disability community. And so if you have an issue and it's problematic, but it's not a rights violation, then under our goals and priorities and our grants, we wouldn't be able to accept the matter. And that goes to this likelihood of success prong. Because although we're a large agency, there's a lot of problems in the state and a lot of issues we have to address. And so we can really only take the cases where there might be legal merit, especially since our role as a, a public interest law firm requires us to think about whether litigation would be appropriate in a particular case. And so these case selection criteria kind of guide us to assess, are we gonna escalate a case from intake to assigning it to an advocate or attorney? And so here's just our contact information again. This is for intake, 1-800-342-0823. Um, and thanks for taking the time to, to listen today. And you know I hope this answered those questions that I put out at the beginning about who we are and kind of what we do. Thank you, Kevin. That was very informative. And just to repeat what I said earlier, uh, after this webinar, there will be an email sent out uh, with a link where people can download these PowerPoint presentations. I'm going to go ahead and offer, uh, ask Eric to come back on as well. Uh, and the, the last several minutes we have here uh, to go through some of these questions received. Uh, and if you haven't had an opportunity, now is a great time to go ahead and ask your questions in the Q&A box. Um, so one of the questions I see that we've had uh, coming to you, Kevin, as, as we just uh, wrapped up your presentation was uh, IEP, so individualized education plans in the schools. Uh, if an individual feels like their rights are being violated in that process, is that something that uh, would be uh, an intake that uh, somebody should reach out to, to, to Disability Rights Florida with? Definitely, definitely. We have a, a whole team of advocates and attorneys who focus on ensuring that people have appropriate IEPs. And we attend IEP meetings to advocate on behalf of students with disabilities. And even when necessary, we'll file for due process to ensure an IEP is appropriate. Perfect, perfect. Eric, this one's for you. I know that you said you, uh, you know, your team has expanded quite a bit from six to 12 different centers across the state. Where, where is the best place to go to see where all those centers are? Or is it just calling, calling your office? Or wh where could they find out more information about uh, if there's a location near them? Yeah, uh, certainly pick up the phone and give us a call or go to our website, uh, fast.org. It's two A's. Um, and then we've got under the, I believe it's under the services section, there's a whole list of the demonstration centers that you will find there. And it's listed. You'll see what county um, they serve. So you make sure you call the call the proper proper center. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, and then we had a handful of individuals reach out with some upcoming events uh, and seeing if we we're going to be able to attend. I know several of the ones that were mentioned. I know Able United will be there. So um, and and fast. Uh, we'll make sure we'll pass that along to see if they're going to be able to attend some of those. Um, here's another question for you, Kevin. 
in regards to private employers. So um, do you litigate against private employers? I'm assuming if there's a, uh, the first step is not litigation, hopefully. Uh, it's more of that advocacy training education when it comes to somebody's needs being met. But um, I'm assuming if it ever gets to that point, is that something that your team will look at? Yeah, we'll consider litigation against private employers. Um, we do it less often. We do provide direct advocacy to the employers and we can assist with or draft a charge with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. If we do that and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission finds cause, then we could consider um, a suit against the private employer. Um, but those are more rare. That's more rare. Our, the bulk of our work with private employers is that direct advocacy and then sometimes escalating okay. it to EEOC. Okay. Um, just looking through some of these questions here. Now, you, now this could be for either of you when it comes to other resources available. This person asks, is, uh, any adult service support in finding independent living for individuals with autism, right? So, so I know personally, Able United doesn't help with that type of referral um, and usually point back to the Agency for Persons with Disabilities um, or other the types of resources. But outside of uh, that sounds like to me it's outside of the scope for, for both of you all uh, in terms to, to helping somebody find supports and services. I could be wrong. Kevin, Eric? We would certainly try to help. It would probably end up being, like you said, it would be a referral back to, to an agency or an organization that is better suited for that. But certainly don't hesitate to, to call and we'll, we'll certainly try to, to point you in the right direction if it's not something we directly do. Yes, yeah, same. Um, if someone's looking for services, we won't engage in the process of finding them. Um, but I know there's a couple questions too about if APD denies a service, like a companion service, would we assist with that? And we would. Um, our goal is making sure people can live in the community. And so if APD denies services that facilitate community living, we can assist with that. All right. Um, I see, you know, there's a handful of like one offs when it comes to just some some uh, guidance in from Disability Rights Board, if that's an appropriate thing. And I think you really hammered it towards the end there, right? Because it has to be going back to, is it violating the rights of an individual with a disability more so than if there's a case or a situation where it just happens to involve an individual with a disability? Uh, and so I think that's kind of a, a good guideline. So, for example, if somebody said eviction, I'm assuming if they're eviction because, oh, now that you uh, have to use a wheelchair for accessibility needs, we're going to kick you out. I'm, I'm assuming, or, or we don't allow service dogs. Um, those would probably be areas that you would be more so uh, attuned to. That's right. That's exactly right. All right. Um, so one more time, I know we have a couple of minutes here and we'll be uh, have a follow-up uh, with your presentations, but if you could all... Just one more time, give the website, because I think that's for, I know for us, we usually always refer people uh, back to our website because that houses so much of the information. But uh, high level, what, where can people find you on the web? So FAST website is www.faast.org. And disability rights is www.disabilityrightsflorida.org, all one word. Awesome. And of course, Able United, www.ableunited.com. Well, Kevin, Eric, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking some time out of your day today to really discuss some of these resources that individuals may not be aware of. For those of you that did attend it, there will be a post follow up email. That will have a, a link to a Dropbox where you can download these presentations and a separate email that will come directly from me for those individuals that are seeking a certificate of completion for this educational unit for waiver support coordinators or supporting living coaches. That will come out uh, tomorrow or probably early next week. So uh, I know you guys will be looking forward to that. But uh, just want to thank Eric and Kevin again for, for taking some time out and discuss these very important resources, and hopefully now you will have the tools to help you educate and uh, provide the information that you need to the individuals you all serve. So 
with that, knowledge is power. We appreciate your time and we'll, uh, welcome to hopefully do this again in the future. So thank you, Eric, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. With that, thank you all and have a wonderful day.